welcome to EPG Pakshala lectures on numerical methods to module 18. In this module, we are going to consider the case studies related to the numerical methods that we have studied in the earlier modules. Uh, learning objective set for this is basically one objective that is role of numerical methods in real world applications and this is illustrated through two case studies. One is from industry and one is from academic institutions, the uh, MTech or research oriented. In earlier modules, various numerical methods were introduced for solving some mathematical problems. Some simple applications of these methods were also discussed. However, in real world problems, these numerical methods seldom works in isolation. So, only one uh, numerical method will work for solving the entire problem under consideration that, is, that does not happen uh, in general. In fact, any real world application will start with a mathematical modeling to convert the problem under consideration into a tractable mathematical form. So, first thing is mathematical modeling. The second thing is such mathematical problems uh, rarely have analytical solutions and hence we look for a numerical solution. So, prior to computing numerical solution, one has to do the numerical modeling of the mathematical problem. So, as to convert the problem in such a way that to make it amenable for application of numerical methods. So, that means, you will have to decide what kind of experimentation you are going to get, what kind of data you are going to study, what kind of uh, uh, analysis of that data or what kind of uh, computations to be performed on this data all this that has to be decided in this numerical model. Often it is required to apply combinations of more than one numerical method. So, only one numerical method will work uh, that may not happen or we may have to have some innovative improvisations of the existing methods will be required to be done in order to get the meaningful solutions to the problem under consideration. We will uh, illustrate these techniques by presenting two case studies over here. At the outset, I will just say that these case studies are based on the problems which were uh, partially tackled in the modeling week organized by an ITM universe Vadodara in collaboration with the Department of Applied Mathematics MS University of Baroda, Vadodara and Industrial Mathematics Group IIT Bombay during 10 to 14 March at ITM universe Vadodara under the national program on differential equations theory computations and applications of DST actually. So, this is DST initiative and uh, this pr problems have been discussed in those uh, academic events. The first problem was proposed by one of the industries in Vadodara and the second problem was proposed by Mr. Amit Patel, an associate professor at MS University of Baroda in mechanical engineering department and uh, that is how we have considered these two case studies here. So, first case study is determination of the relationship between the quality parameters of the Bundy tube and the wastages. So, what is the Bundy tube? Bundy tube is a double wall brazed steel tube which is constructed from copper coated steel strips which is rolled twice around laterally and then brazed in a furnace to produce a tube of double wall structure with a clear scale free copper bore hole that means, and a plated external surface and a consistently uniform wall thickness. So, this is what the description of the tube is. So, we are trying to find out when you are testing these tubes, it is possible that the, there may be some manufacturing defects and you may have to cut the tubes or you may have to some of the tubes will have to be rejected and there will be some wastages associated with that. And we want to consider the relationship between the wastages and the various quality parameters of the body tubes. The manufacturing of the tube uh, involves like this, uh, you take a raw steel given by the supplier and it is coated with copper on both the sides in the electroplating division of the plant making of tube 
is divided into three stages as follows. In stage 1, the unbraised tube is made by 7 mill processes and this 7 mill processes are as follows. So, B welling that is you are turning around, second first forming, the third is second forming. So, you are forming a tube, the third forming. So, there are three stages to which it is formed, fourth forming and then the first finishing you have to do and second finishing and all this is done in automatic machines actually. The figure 6 shows the aerial view of a machine which carries out the assembly of all the processes and figure 7 shows the process of forming a tube from the coated steel plate. Here are the figures. So, these are the 7 mills that you are talking about, this is the aerial view we are taking. So, this is what the pro, there are 7 processes that we are doing here and this is the forming of a tube. So, if you have got a plate here that plate is rolled and the tubes are formed. So, this is how the entire tube will be formed. So, ultimately you will get a tube here like this. Stage 2 is brazing. So, in this stage a batch of 31 unbrazed tubes they are simply rolled here. Now, brazing is done uh, unbrazed tubes are brazed so as to make it hard and usable for brakes and fuel tubes. For brazing purpose these tubes are passed through a furnace which has 5 different zones without any physical barrier and having different temperature between 950 degree to 1130 degree. So, each tube is in, uh, I mean inserted into the furnace and then it is brazed over there. Following to the furnace section there is a cooling section and in the cooling section the tubes which have been heated up to the brazing temperature which is approximately 1130 degree centigrade are cooled down on a length of 62 meter in a forming gas atmos uh, atmosphere to approximately 60 degree to 70 degrees centigrade. So, they are all uh, cooled down to this particular level from 1130 degree centigrade to this. What is this forming gas? Forming gas is a collective term used for the gas mixture with a uh, slight reducing effect out of nitrogen and the hydrogen H 2. Our forming gas is used for cooling down consists of 90 percent nitrogen and 10 percent hydrogen that is H 2. After passing through these processes the tubes become ready for use. The stage 3 is testing quality of the tube. The there are two types of testing we are doing the physical testing we do first pieces of 10 randomly selected tubes are checked manually in three different processes in the quality section of the plant and the three processes are the flaring that is end forming flattening and third is pressure test if the defects are found in more than 4 or 5 tubes then the whole batch of 10 tubes is rejected. So, that will go to the wastages. Otherwise that batch of tube is then passed through the next testing level as this physical testing is not the 100 percent guarantee of the quality. Next stage is ED current testing. Now, the ED current test is an electrical method for non destructive material testing it is applied for testing electrically conductive materials that is copper nitrogen uh, double uh, double waste uh, tubes actually we are considering. When a tube is passed in the eddy current testing device it detects the void space left in between the two layers the copper lumps and any brazing defect of the tube or any flaws left in the tube in the manufacturing process. So, here is a figure that will 
this is the eddy current device we are talking about. Now, these are the defects at your void spaces are there in between the two layers. So, there are two layers, layers here, this is B wailing that we are doing. So, the wounding of uh, plate is done like this and therefore, there is a B wailing uh, uh, happening here. Now, these are the two layers that we are getting. So, there are voids in between. Now, these voids are not allowed for a quality tubes and therefore, this is considered to be a defect. There may be some other defects also, all these defects are identified in this uh, eddy current device. And so, when a tube is passed in the eddy current testing device, it detects the void spaces left in between the two layers, the copper lumps, if there is any copper lump around, and the brazing defect of the tube or any flaws left in the tube in the manufacturing process. This testing is done by passing one tube at a time through the testing machine. If a void or any flaw is detected, then the tube gets crimped. So, that portion will be crimped and then it is cut 6 centimeter from both the ends and so that much portion of the tube will be cut and not used. So, again that will uh, count to wastages. If more than 5 crimps are detected, then the tube is discarded, otherwise the tube is used. And the third testing is chemical testing. In the chemical testing, the tubes are then passed through different chemical baths for testing the tube material characteristics. And the chemical baths consist of the following chemicals, namely casein that is potassium cyanide. CuCN that is copper cyanide uh, and then Rolles salt and then carbonate. So, these are the various chemicals that are being used for uh, testing the material characteristics. Given the data regarding various test parameters and the corresponding vestiges of tubes, it was required to identify the parameters which significantly affect the vestiges and find a relationship between the vestige and the parameters identified in part A. So, that is what we want to find out. So, we are not going into going much into the technical details of manufacturing process or material and all that. We are simply looking at this particular part. So, what we are going to consider is we are going to consider data regarding the various parameters and corresponding vestiges and from this data we want to analyze that which parameters are significantly affecting and finding out relationship between this. So, the numerical model that we are going to select that it was decided to study the sensitivity of the following parameters to the wastage of tubes. What parameters we consider? We said that see there are two tanks in that process tank number 8 and 9 and in both these tanks there are certain parameters there and therefore, level for a level of the tank we are considering. So, there will be level in tank 8 and tank 9. So, there are uh, two parameters here, third and fourth parameter is pH for the tank 8, tank 9, chemicals for 5 and 6 and which are the chemical casein that is potassium cyanide that is that will be this 7, 8 CUCN copper cyanide. So, this 7 is referring to tank 8 and 8 is referring to tank 9 and the 9 and 10 this roll is salt 11 12 carbonate. So, each one first is for tank 8 and another is for tank 9. Apart from that there is a strip thickness and strip hardness and then you have got 15 to 17 that is plating uh, thickness is at left center and right These are the parameters that we are going to talk about. The values of these parameters and the corresponding wastage are recorded in all the three shifts for a month and are used and these records are used for carrying out the study. So, we have got a data from the industry uh, for one month where the all these parameter values are being recorded, corresponding wastages are recorded and this data is given for uh, carrying out the study. The methodology that we are going to adopt is for accomplishing the task 1, 
statistical techniques called principal component analysis is used, which identifies few parameters which are likely to significantly influence wastages. In fact, uh, this uh, principal component analysis will convert this parameter. See, these are all uh, 17 dimensional data that means, because 17 parameter independent parameters and one wastage is we are talking about. So, we are talking about a 17 uh, dimensional space of independent parameters data space we can call it. Now, we want to find out. So, we are what happens at this principal uh, component analysis what it does is it will convert the space into another space where it is possible to reduce identify certain principal components and reduce the dimension of that space and express your variable or parameters in terms of the lesser dimension and then do the analysis and then again come back to the original uh, data space. Then second, the, so that is what we are using principal component analysis that we are going to use and then curve fitting technique discussed in module 8 and 9 is used to find the relationship between the vestiges and identified parameters by task 1. So, that is what we will be doing. So, what is principal component analysis? PCA is a way of identifying patterns in data and expressing the data so as to highlight their similarities and differences. Since patterns in data can be hard to find in data of high dimension, because we do not have any graphical picture about that because it is very high dimensional data. So, we do not have luxury of graphical representation is not available. So, PCA is a powerful tool uh, for analyzing the data in high dimension. Following are the steps to perform a principal component analysis on a set of data. So, step 1 get the data to be analyzed as mentioned above our data consists of values of the n parameters I am writing in general. So, n parameters and corresponding vestiges in all we have considered s observations. So, how many records are available for each data? So, that is s observations we are considering that is s records consisting of n plus 1 values. In our case n is 17 because we have considered 7 independent parameters 1 vestige is that is 18 therefore, n plus 1 we consider here and s is the number of observations that is 153. The first n columns of these records are stored in the uh, s cross n matrix A. So, we are calling that matrix as n matrix A matrix of original data and the last column which records uh, the vestiges is stored in a vector w. So, s by 1 vector that is s dimensional vector we are considering. And step 2 calculate the covariance matrix. Now, what is what we are doing is we are trying to find out covariances that means, how these parameters independent parameters are uh, vary with each other that is what we are trying to find out. So, covariance what is covariance? Covariance of a parameter x sin parameter x j that is what I have to find out. So, covariance matrix will be when you are uh, if you have got 17 parameters it will be 17 by 17 matrix. So, n parameters n by n matrix will be getting of covariance and therefore, we are saying n by n matrix which is covariance matrix and covariance of x i and x j is obtained as what x i k that means, kth observation we are taking minus x i bar x j k that is kth observation of x j minus x j bar take the product and sum of all these products from k equal to 1 to s. So, if, if there are s observations you add all of them this products you all of them and divide by s minus 1 it is something similar to variances that we do. If I use here covariance of x i x i it is just the variance of x i. So, your variance of x i that is what you study in statistics that can be considered and uh, can be little bit extended. So, if it is used for two different parameters then it will be x i x i. So, covariance of x i x i if it is used for x i alone then it will be co variance covariance of x i alone that is what will happen. 
suppose now if I consider z i k that is this I am writing it as z i k for example and this will be z j k say. Then I can say that for all these values and I write z i as a set of s cross 1 column vector of z i k's then covariance of x i x j can be straight away written as the z i transpose z j. So, z i transpose z j which will give you this sum and that will be written in a just a short form we can write it as z i transpose z j into a divided by s minus 1. Thus, we can compute n cross n covariance matrix. Once we get covariance matrix you know what is happening how these parameters are uh, interfering with each other or related with each other that is given by the covariance matrix. Then step 3 compute all eigenvalues and corresponding eigenvectors of covariance matrix. Now, we have studied in the previous uh, module how to compute all eigenvalues and we use here Jacobi method. And note that covariance matrix is symmetric because if you write here covariance of x i x j or covariance of x j x i will be same because these products are not going to change by changing the order. And therefore, the i j th element and j i th element both of them are going to be identical and therefore, the matrix is symmetric and therefore, your Jacobi method that we used in the earlier module is uh, applicable. So, hence, hence the Jacobi method as discussed in module 17 can be used to compute all these eigenvalues and corresponding eigenvectors. You know that Jacobi method converts the matrix into a diagonal matrix and another matrix x of all eigenvectors. So, these eigenvectors are mutually orthogonal because that is what that is how it has been done uh, for a symmetric matrix they are all anyway mutually orthogonal and we must ensure that the magnitude of it, these vectors are must be 1. So, that they form an orthonormal basis for the data space this is what we are converting. So, that means we are converting the whole data space in terms of different basis basis uh, given by the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. Then step 4 is choosing components and forming a feature vector. So, we are now trying to reduce the dimension here. What we are doing here? Once the eigenvectors are found from the covariance matrix, order them in by the magnitudes of the eigenvalues. So, highest eigenvalue that will be considered as first and then later on next highest, then next highest like that. So, you uh, in the decreasing order we consider. So, this gives you the components in the order of significance. So, now if you like you can decide to ignore some of the components of lesser significance. So, that means the components having uh, lesser eigen I mean eigenvalue is very small we can ignore those eigenvectors and thereby reduce the dimension of the eigenspace of the data. Okay. So, you do lose some information by ignoring these components, but if ignored eigenvalues are small you do not lose much. So, if you leave out some components and the final data set will have lesser dimension than the original one. Let us see little more precisely. So, if you are originally having n dimensions in your data and so you calculate n eigenvectors and eigenvalues arrange the eigenvectors as mentioned above that means, in the decreasing order of magnitude of eigenvalues because each eigenvalues identify uh, corresponds with the eigenvector. So, according to the order of eigenvalue we arrange the eigenvectors as well. So, we arrange eigenvectors like that and choose only the first p eigenvectors instead of considering all the n eigenvectors I am considering only p eigenvectors which will which are more significant that means, whose eigenvalue is little more significant and if their eigenvalue is very small we can ignore rest of the eigenvectors and therefore, the final data set has only p dimensions. What needs to be done now is to form a feature vector, feature vector what do you feature vector is a fancy name given to uh, which is matrix constructed by taking first p eigenvectors that you want to keep and forming n cross p matrix q. So, q matrix is a feature vector what is q matrix? q matrix is first p eigenvectors. So, 17 by p. So, that is our n by p that will be the matrix the dimension of the matrix n by p and that is matrix q and that is my feature vector. 
Now, for this the uh, selection of p eigenvectors, how this p eigenvectors are selected? So, what normally we do is we do not use directly the eigenvalues, but we consider what is called mu i, which is nothing but lambda i divided by lambda 1 plus lambda 2. So, trace of that diagonal matrix that we get. So, lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda n we are considering, we divide by that, where lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda n are the eigenvalues of covariance matrix arranged in decreasing order of magnitude. Now, this mu i is called as energy associated with eigenvector and you can see that it will be always between 0 and 1. So, we compute the cumulative energy. So, you go on adding. So, mu 1 plus mu 2 plus mu p and you go on changing mu p will be equal to 1, 2, 3 and so on. So, I will get only one eigenvector if I consider if I only one mu 1 I consider I will get up to one vector then mu 1 plus mu 2 then mu 1 plus mu 2 plus mu 3 and so on you go on doing that and then you select p which gives cumulative energy more than 90 percent. Suppose only 5 vectors are required to reach 90 percent energy of that then you can select only 5 eigenvectors. If, if, uh, if it requires 10 then you select 10 eigenvectors or something like that. So, you try to get energy around 90 percent or more than 90 percent or up to some desired level and that is how this p is selected. So, how many eigenvectors are to be selected will depend on how much total energy up to p you get. Now, step 5 is deriving the new data set. So, original data is in the form of n dimensional vector expressed in the standard basis. Okay. So, n dimensional vector expressed in the standard basis. The eigenvectors provided uh, provide a spe uh, spectral basis to this n dimensional vector space and by choosing the first p principal components we reduce the dimension of the data space to p. So, that is what we are trying to do. So, what I am trying to say is each observation is a vector. So, that is row vector of the data matrix A. So, row vector is a uh, vector in the 17 dimensional space or n dimensional space we are considering. n eigenvectors will form a basis for that n dimensional vector space. Now, I decide to consider only 5 or p eigenvectors. So, I am now going to uh, derive I mean consider a space generated by only p first p eigenvectors. So, that means the dimension of the data space will be now reduced. So, the original n dimensional vector is now represented with respect to the new basis consisting of only p eigenvectors. Thus, our new data will be an approximation to the original data and not exactly true data. So, uh, represented by s cross p matrix instead of s cross n matrix and p is usually taken to be smaller than n in order to make sure that your uh, regression model fits better. Thus, the new data which I am writing it as A modified is given by A cross Q. So, what is the original data matrix multiplied by Q. Now, this original data matrix is what? S rows P uh, n columns, Q is n cross P and therefore, I will get this as S cross P. So, matrix mentioned above. In this process, some information is lost but the way the principal components are selected what we lose is not much. The variables associated with the co columns of A mod are denoted by y 1, y 2, y p. Now, they are not going to be original parameters. These are the parameters in the eigenspace of the original data space because now the basis has changed. So, therefore, these vectors are in the new basis. So, if you really want to get their representation, so they are going to be linear combinations. So, they are going to be linear combinations of original all original parameters. So, that is how they are the they are uh, parameters in new data space and they are linear combinations of all the parameters in the old data space. So, step 6 is fitting a linear regression model 
two wastages against the new variable. So, now we have got only uh, y 1, y 2, y 3, y p variables to these p variables we are fitting the wastages. That means, we are fitting a model w equal to beta 1 y 1 plus beta 2 y 2 plus beta p y p and using regression analysis as we did in uh, our modules earlier, here this will be multivariate regression and therefore, we uh, do that and find out these values of beta 1, beta 2 and beta p and for that we are using here a uh, MATLAB routine available for regression model. So, the new data values against original vestiges using MATLAB routine. So, this is what we have been doing here. So, let beta bar be the vector p cross 1 vector given by beta 1, beta 2, beta p. So, these are the components of beta bar vector. Now, step 7 is you have to express because these are the hidden parameters their user is not going to know what is this y 1, y 2, y 3, y n. What we have to do is we have to talk about the original parameters. So, therefore, y 1, y 2, y 3, y p are expressed in terms of x 1, x 2, x 3, x n and they are expressed like and then we get a model again w equal to alpha 1 x 1 plus alpha 2 x 2 plus alpha n x n and how do you find out this alpha bar? Reversing the process. So, that means, what we are doing is n cross 1 column vector alpha bar can be computed by alpha bar equal to q times beta bar. So, that feature vector makes all the difference here. So, once I get this I get my already regression model or fitting already uh, the relationship between. So, this gives me the relationship between the original parameters and the vestiges and then looking at how this alpha 1 and alpha 2 and phi n are which parameter influences more that we can identify and therefore, getting such a uh, relationship is more important, but you can see that in order to determine if you are directly fit this particular model into original data, it will be regression in 17 dimensional space or n dimensional space and that may take uh, that may not be uh, very well uh, done. So, in order to get the good regression fit, we go to the principal components y 1, y 2, y p in the new data space. So, this is what we are trying to do here. Now, these are the results and conclusions that we are going to show here. So, this is your original data you can see a level in tank 8 and tank 9, pH in tank 8, tank 9 and all those 17 parameters as mentioned earlier. So, this is my row vector of data. So, this up to this and vestiges is the last column w. So, that is w and that is how we get data in this particular form. We convert we try to compute the covariance matrix C for 17 independent variables the first 17 column of the data and is computed as shown here. So, this is what the covariance matrix that we get. Then we consider the uh, apply your uh, Jacobi method to covariance matrix and that will give me a diagonal matrix D whose diagonal entries are going to give me the eigenvalues of matrix covariance matrix A. You can see that off diagonal elements are almost 0, okay? almost 0 in the sense that we are giving some tolerances normally. So, we get almost 0. So, only diagonal elements remain. So, this becomes an approximately diagonal matrix and then this uh, another uh, matrix we get of eigenvectors. So, P is a matrix of eigenvectors. So, these are 17 eigenvectors that we get. So, this is your eigenspace that you get from this matrix. Now, we are talking about, uh, so this is matrix P. So, energy associated with each eigenvector is computed from the corresponding eigenvalue lambda i as given by mu i equal to lambda i divided by lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda n. And if I arrange it in the increasing uh, de descending order as follows. So, what we are getting is first mu 1 is 0 0.56052, next is 0 0.30062 and so on and so forth. So, we get you can see that the later on the values of mu becomes very very small and therefore, if you computing cumulative energy of first 5 mu i, I am going to get sum of 0 0.95207. 
So, 95 percent energy is already stored in only first 5 components. So, these are my principal components. So, I am going to consider only first 5 mu i's and corresponding eigen, uh, vectors I am going to call them as y 1, y 2, y 3, y 5 and then I get the original data that means this 17 by 5 matrix Q is formed that is my feature vector. So, which what is my feature vector? Feature vector is obtained from this matrix P. So, you take first 5 vectors of this that is my feature vector uh, which is already given here. So, this is my matrix Q and then we can multiply original data A by Q to uh, we get new data space. So, spectral basis we get as 153 by uh, cross 5 that so new uh, data set I will get A f as sample which is sampled like this. So, I will be getting 153 rows will be there and there will be 5 columns. So, this is just a sample of that final data set is given to you here and then we are considering the fit that we get regression fit we got is w equal to this. So, this is my beta 0, beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, beta 4, beta 5 and then you convert back into this. So, I get alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 and I get original fit will be like this. So, alpha bar is obtained from here by taking q cross beta bar, beta bar I get from here and then what I can see is I from this regression model I am computing the vestiges. So, computed vestiges are plotted against the observed vestiges and you can see that this going on the middle uh, this red one is the computed one and this blue one is the original vestiges we get. So, computed versus observed vestiges we are considering and root mean square error we get is 15.1419. So, you can see here that whatever we wanted we have, we have achieved by using 2, 3 different techniques. So, principal uh, component analysis, then we are considering a concept of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, we are using regression model. So, all these combinations of methods are required to do this. Now, we are going to take case study, we will go through this case study a little fast and uh, uh, this is a thermal performance of metallic sphere cooled under the stagnant atmosphere, uh, atmospheric air condition. So, heat dissipation for example, uh, to the environment through a metallic body under trans, uh, transient condition is a complex phenomena. <coughs> Any metallic body when it is heated and allowed to cool down in atmospheric uh, temperature, then heat dissipates to the uh, surrounding and this dissipation phenomena is a complex phenomena. So, we have to find out what is the heat transfer coefficient, we have to find out how the temperature is reducing. So, all that you have to study here. So, the temperature governing the heat transfer is varying, uh, but it will also very various temperature dependent thermophysical properties also. Not only temperature will decrease, but this also will change. Here we study the heat dissipation phenomena in terms of the heat transfer coefficient h from the surface to ambient which itself is dependent on the interface temperature. To carry out this study, the experiment was performed in the uh, mechanical engineering department of MS University Baroda and from the experimental data the task as mentioned above were accomplished. So, here a steel ball is heated for some period of time and then it is taken out and put in a stagnant atmosphere to cool down. So, that is done. The problem is to study the heat dissipation phenomena in terms of the heat transfer coefficient h from the surface to sphere, uh, uh, surface of the sphere to the surrounding stagnant atmosphere. So, that is what you have to do. This is the schematic of the experimental setup. So, this is the, the spherical ball we are considering. These are the thermocouples attached to that to measure the temperature. This is the uh, electric heater in which the ball is heated spherical ball is heated, then it is stagnant atmosphere, it is allowed to cool down here and the temperatures are measured and this is the molt uh, millivolt meter actually which measures this millivolt 
and then uh, from that millivolt data we compute the heat uh, temperatures and then from temperature we try to find out heat transfer coefficient. The experiment was performed as follows, the steel solid ball was first put in the uh, one radiant heater with uniform pitch, four thermocouples T C uh, we are saying were embedded uh, at equidistance on the surface of metallic ball at a single horizontal plane. These thermocouples were connected to the millivoltmeter uh, in parallel arrangement to the uh, to measure the average surface temperature. Since the thermocouples are embedded on the surface and are made an integral part of the sphere, the thermal continuity of the sphere and the thermocouples is maintained. So, that is assured. So, surface of metallic sphere and the embedded thermocouples are at the same thermal level that is ensured. The steel ball is heated by inserting it in a heater for a required period of time. Once the ball is heated, it is withdrawn from the heater and is allowed to cool down in a stagnant atmosphere. The millivolt versus time history of the cooling sphere is recorded by using a movie camera and using this millivolt values and uh, average surface temperature of the sphere is computed at the regular time interval. Our first task is to convert millivolt values into temperature values using the known formula from the literature which is very simple task and then find out heat transfer coefficients which is also again a simple task because you are going to use a regular ready made formula from the another formula from the literature. But idea is not that what is important is that in order to save time and efforts for the experiment and the uh, further computations the user was interested in recording the experimental data for a fixed number of period of time steps and computing the temperature and heat transfer coefficients as mentioned above and then looking at the trend of these values predict these values for some more time steps in future. So, for example, in our case we have considered uh, 300 time steps 300 seconds we are taking the data, but what we want to do is we want to use 200 seconds data and want to predict further 100 seconds data and compare with observed data. So, that is what we are trying to do here. So, the numerical model since in this case the study the computations were required to be done on the basis of experimental data using known formula mathematical modeling or the process was not required and hence just the numerical model for accomplishing the desired task is discussed here. For the specific study here it was decided to heat the metallic ball to some temperature in between 400 to 800 degree Celsius. Now, this is what specifics that we are entering into. Then the metallic ball is allowed to cool down for about 300 seconds and the millivolt MV readings are recorded at an interval of 5 seconds each. The experimental data as time in seconds versus millivolt MV is illustrated in the first two columns of table 2. So, we are we will show that. It was decided to use observations till 200 seconds to compute the temperature values from the given values of MV using the following formula 1 available in the literature and then compute the heat transfer coefficient H from the again another formula 2. And looking at the trends of these values, we want to predict the value of the temperature and heat transfer coefficient for the uh, further 100 seconds and compare these values with the corresponding observed values. So, that is what we want to do. So, this is the formula 1 for computing temperature from the millivolt. So, V is the millivolt that we are going to consider and then these are the various parameters V 0, P 1, T 0 all these are parameters and which are already given in the literature we can find out from the literature all these parameters. The typical values of the parameters in the above formula 
for k type thermocouple. So, what is the type of thermocouple that you have to see and for different temperature ranges as given in the table 1 that is what you have to find out. So, for our purpose we select the values of the parameters for the temperature range between 400 to 800 degrees Celsius. We are hitting our uh, metallic ball up to 600 degrees Celsius here. So, uh, then the computed temperature values are illustrated in the column 3 of the table 2. By using this temperature values, heat transfer coefficient H T are calculated by the following formula and that that is given uh, as in the column 4 of the table 2. So, this is the formula that we use for heat transfer coefficient H. <coughs> so, H at time step i th time step tau i is given by this, the temperature C 0, temperature ambient and all that we are considering here. So, all these parameters are expressed here. A is surface area of the metallic sphere which is measured in m square, C is the heat capacity that is joules k per kg per uh, Kelvin, tau is the elapsed time for cooling of metallic bodies, T ambient is the ambient temperature that is taken to be 34 3.4 degree centigrade, rho is the density of the air and metallic sphere per kg uh, meter cube that is what we are doing and then V is the volume of the sphere in met meter cube, it is given that rho V C by A is this. So, this is already given these values because these are the values of the specific material that we are using here. And then we try to find out this is my table 1 which gives me the parameters. So, what parameters we are using? This is uh, parameter values. So, what are the parameters? V max that is what is maximum minimum voltage, maximum voltage, minimum temperature, maximum temperature, T 0 initial temperature, initial voltage then P 1, P 2, P 3 all these parameters are appearing in that those formulae and we are using this particular uh, parameters from this table because we want to temperature range between 400 to 800. So, that is what we are considering and then we are considering the prediction of the values for the temperature T and heat transfer coefficient H for 201 seconds to 300 seconds. We use two different techniques to achieve this task. One is exponential curve fitting and since the, the plots of the time versus temperature shown exponential trend, we are using that and we are using this. Uh, so, data points tau i capital T i for i equal to 0 to 200 and we are doing the exponential fit uh, and this method was already discussed in module 9 earlier and this exponential fit is obtained like this from the algorithms given in that module and where temperature predicted denotes the predicted temperature and tau denotes the time in seconds. This curve is then used to compute the predicted values of the temperature for 0 to 300 seconds, all the 300 seconds using data of 200 seconds only. And then the observed temperature values and the predicted temperature values are plotted against this. So, these are the uh, table 2 which shows your seconds, millivolt values, actual temperature, then computed values of the heat transfer coefficients, predicted temperature and predicted heat transfer coefficient that is what we are saying. Then we have got uh, this is the graphical representation comparison of actual and predicted temperature values. You can see that there is a difference variation actually and towards the end this variation increases. This green shows that they are not uh, actually used in the data. So, they are all predicted from the model and these are the observed values actually. So, actual temperature values is observed, they are predicted, extract uh, from temperature values from the exponential curve fit. Using the predicted temperature values, we compare co uh, compute the predicted values of the heat transfer coefficients using formula 2 and then that is also plotted we can observe that the extrapolated values of the temperature and observed values of the temperature do not match well and here is the fit for this comparison of actual H versus predicted H using the exponential model and therefore, we say that we will have to go through the new technique actually because this fitting is not good. So, we are using adaptive linear interpolation, a very simple idea. In this approach, we use the 
temperature values at time steps in between 0 to 200 seconds to predict the temperature values for 201 to 300 seconds and in order to predict the values of the temperature what we are trying to do is we are trying to value uh, get a data like this. So, at time tau i we do not uh, we do the linear interpolation over the data values T i minus 3 T tau i minus 3 tau i minus 3 and temperature at that point tau i minus 1 and temperature at that time. So, what we are doing is at tau i if I want to do I am taking I am going 3 step back. So, I am taking uh, tau i minus 3 and corresponding temperature tau i minus 1 and corresponding temperature fit a linear data and take that exp extrapolate that and take use this value here. So, that is how I go on doing it for first 200 seconds. So, that is what we are doing here and the when you are doing linear interpolation it is simple that this is a t of tau i minus 1 minus t of tau i minus 3 divided by this putting tau equal to tau i and we get finally, uh, this value. So, we get this the minus this uh, is equal to this that is my linear model that I am fitting between the two points this two points and then uh, using that I am trying to find out this. So, you can see here that tau i minus tau i minus 1 is delta t and tau i minus 1 to tau i minus 3 is 2 times delta t and we get a simple formula like this for cal calculating estimated value of t tau i and once I do that the predicted and observed values of the temperature for 200 to 300 seconds are illustrated in column 2, 3 of the table uh, and h using formula 2 and these values are given in columns 4 and 5 of the table 3 comparison observed and all these are given in the figure 3 and 4. So, we will just see the figures 3 and 4 now and this is what the table 3 gives me. So, seconds 201. So, I am only using for 201 to 301 and we are getting these values. So, once I get these values observed and the predicted ones and I plot this. So, if I plot this for 200 to 300 seconds only I am plotting. So, actual prediction and you can see that the matching is quite close here. Then this is about the comparison of h values and that also is quite close. So, that is how I get it is clear from the plots that this technique gives better result as compared to the earlier technique. So, we have got here uh, these are the different techniques we can use. So, in the summary we can see here that in this module we presented two case studies one of which is initiated by an industrial problem and other is initiated by M tech project work in the academic institution. The first case study demonstrates that how combination of different numerical methods will help us to accomplish this study and the second case study uh, gives demonstrate that how an improvisation of a numerical method can help in getting better results. Thank you.